Welcome everybody, both friend and stranger, old and new, to this time of worship in the Unitarian tradition. My name is Diane Rutter and I'm the lay assistant here at Kingswood Meeting House in Hollywood in the West Midlands. My thanks as always go to our organist extraordinaire, Mr Peter Flower, whose skill and patience make these videos possible. Well, in the Christian calendar today, it marks All Saints Day. And we're going to look at people who have done extraordinary things in today's service. And we're going to remember ordinary people who have influenced our own lives. Let us just take a moment now to gather our thoughts before we begin our service. And as Unitarians the world over do, we light our chalice to mark the beginning of our service and to invite the divine into our worship. And our words today are from the Favourite Prayers booklet by the Hinckley Unitarians. As each new day is breaking, as each new day unfolds, take strength and hope and courage for the promise that it holds. stories today come from Stories for Junior Assembly, which was edited by D.M. Prescott and first printed in 1967. And I've used this book for many years as a youth group leader. And they are fairly true stories about real people. Our first today is called The Test. At a time when Christians in the Roman Empire were undergoing persecution for their faith, Constantius Chlorus, father of Constantine the Great, was governor of Britain. And he received orders to persecute the Christians in Britain. But in his heart, he didn't believe that men should be ill-treated for the way they behaved or believed in their faith. However, he ordered all his court to come and burn incense to the emperor. Now, everyone knew that not to do so was punishable by death. And the governor watched closely those of his courtiers who were known to be Christians to see what they would do. 
Some were afraid and burned incense, but others refused to betray their faith. When all had made their choice, Constantius Chlorus said, those who are false to their God will never be true to their prince. And he dismissed from their posts those who had denied their faith, while he gave greater responsibility to those who had stood firm, because he knew that he could trust them. And I invite you now to join with me in saying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our second reading is called Two Kinds of Courage. There are two kinds of courage and both were shown by a 15 year old French shepherd boy many years ago. His name was Jean-Baptiste Jupil and he was guarding his flock in the mountains with six younger boys when they were attacked by a mad and rabid dog. With fearless courage, Jean-Baptiste seized the dog and managed to kill it with his bare hands, but not before he had been bitten severely. He was threatened with the terrible death of rabies. But then came the call for the second kind of courage, moral courage. In Paris, a scientist called Louis Pasteur had discovered that the disease could be cured by inoculation with the virus from a mad dog. But so far, the cure had only been tried on animals and not on humans. Jean-Baptiste agreed to be the first to be given the new treatment. It was a very brave decision for it might not work. But the treatment did succeed and the brave shepherd's life was saved, as well as the lives of thousands of others in the years to come.
our final reading today is called She Showed the Way. 180 years ago, a crew that suffered a shipwreck had very little hope. The lifeboat service was in its infancy in those days and very poor people were brave enough to go to the rescue of the doomed vessel, even if it was near to the shore. But a brave girl and her lighthouse keeper father took that chance. The girl's name was Grace Darling and her father was William and they lived in the lighthouse on Longstone, one of the Farn Islands off the coast of Northumberland. Early one morning in September, Grace saw the wreck of a ship stuck on a rock from her bedroom window. It was 4.45 in the morning. Well, she ran to the telescope to search for survivors, but it wasn't until seven o'clock in the morning when it became light enough to see that they could tell there were still people alive on the rock. In terrible weather, Grace and Father William decided to row out and rescue the survivors. As they came near the wrecked vessel, they could see that nine people were still clinging to it. The keeper, after several attempts, managed to land on the rock and make his way to the ship, while Grace had the dangerous task of rowing off and on through the wild seas. Only her skill saving the small craft from being dashed to pieces on the rocks. With help from the shipwrecked crew, the only woman survivor and four men were brought to safety. Two of the men went back with William Darling and brought off the rest from the rock. Grace and her mother cared for them all in the lighthouse for two days till the storm abated and they could be taken back to the mainland. For her bravery and skill, Grace became a national heroine. But more importantly, she aroused people's minds to the perils of the sea and how shipwrecked people could be helped so that today we have our magnificent lifeboat service, which saves many lives every year. I've got some notices for you now. Um, for those of you who are willing to share, on Thursday there will be a soup and service service on the WhatsApp group and perhaps it may get posted to the Facebook page. 
If you are about in your home at 12 noon or wherever you are, and you'd like to share your lunch with me safely, separately, then please do so. Uh, Nina won the stitched covenant cushion that was beautifully stitched by Janet. And Peter will be taking our remembrance service next Sunday, so please do tune in to our YouTube channel. A short act of communion will take place toward the end of today's service. If you wish to join in with this act of remembrance, you may wish to pause this video now to prepare some bread and wine. And now we will once more take time for prayer. Almighty God, we express our gratitude for the inborn goodness of average people, for their cheerful laughter, their kindness, their patience and their courage. We express thankfulness for the unnamed heroes of many homes whose service and self-giving gladden the common day and make homes havens of peace. We express thankfulness for the tireless work of those whose service is untiring for others in the institutions and public services of life, who make communal life smooth, pleasurable and efficient. We express gratitude for the simple everyday pleasures and tasks which fill our lives, for beauty in common things, for human love and fellowship, for trust and companionship. We thank thee, O God, for thy spirit within us, and we pray that we may persevere and preserve with that spirit, even unto the end. Amen. Well, I don't know who your heroes were when you were young, but certainly growing up in the late 60s, early 70s, the names Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, and later on Sister Teresa were often bandied about, and these people were held up as examples. But there are a lot of so-called ordinary people to whom I looked up to for guidance in how to live a good life. They're too numerous to mention, but they are what we might think of as average people. They are or were like many others of their peer groups. They're not plaster saints. They have their good and bad points and they are definitely human. We are in the main like them, 
Hopefully, we set a good example, and hopefully, we too will be fondly remembered. But there are those in life who are remembered for one particular act or ideal. The stories that I've read today are not the whole truth. As I said, they were written for junior school assemblies, so they are the shortest version possible. Whether Constantius Chlorus did, as our first story said, may or may not be true. But history does record that his enforcement of Diocletian's edicts of 303 AD against the Christians was deliberately lax. They were supposed to demolish all churches and disband Christian groups and execute them. But Constantius only demolished some churches and we believe that he didn't execute the Christians. However, we must bear in mind that he was a Roman ruler after all and as we read in the history books, they're not all sweetness and light. But he was the father of Constantine the Great the first Roman emperor to profess Christianity and perhaps his father's acts of leniency was something towards the spread of Christianity in the West. Jean-Baptiste Jupil was indeed a shepherd and did kill a rabid dog, not a wolf as it has it in the original version of the story. And they were attacked by this dog, six of them looking after sheep. Now, Jean-Baptiste and Louis Pasteur did not seek one another out. This was due to the mayor of the town where Jean-Baptiste lived, who'd heard of Pasteur's work, and he wrote to Pasteur. Now, it was at least six days before Jean-Baptiste got treatment. And heaven knows what his frame of mind was when agreeing to the injections that were the purported cure. But he must certainly have known of the horrific death that would ensue because of rabies. Many people died from rabies at that time and he would certainly have seen it. Because of his decision, for the first time in the history of the world, people who were bitten by rabid animals no longer had to die if they were able to get vaccinated before the rabies virus had reached their nervous system. I don't know what became of Jean-Baptiste Choupil, I know only of his one act that has left a lasting inheritance for the world. Similarly, it was one act of bravery that brought to the attention of the public of Great Britain the real need for a lifeboat scheme. Both Grace and her father were awarded medals for their bravery, but it is Grace who lives on in the nation's memory. I strongly suspect that it's because she was a woman and in 1838, I don't suppose many women crewed out to rocks to rescue people as Grace did. Her deed was even brought to the attention of Queen Victoria who sent her a 50 pound gift. There was a fledging lifeboat service at that time. It was started in 1824 at the instigation of Sir William Hillary and he persuaded 30 eminent gentlemen of the period to give their support at the inaugural public meeting, which was held in a pub. Many were men of business, and they were neither all saint nor all sinner. Whatever business practices they were involved in at that time, their legacy from that meeting and Gracie's one heroic deed means that today we benefit from the services of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Now in the Oxford Dictionary of the Bible, it says saints are those who are faithful to God and love him and are dedicated to his service. And in the New Testament, saints are always Christians as distinct from non-believers. But my idea of a saint is anyone whose deed or deeds leave a lasting legacy for humankind. A legacy for the betterment of the world or for humankind. It may be one act of bravery or daily acts of kindness. They are not superhuman, just ordinary people who feel called upon to do extraordinary deeds. But there are those average people in our lives 
who have had a profound influence on the way we live and think. Let us today salute the ordinary, the average amongst us, and let us give grateful thanks for them. Amen. Welcome all to this celebration of community and communion. We are gathered here to worship God and to remember Jesus of Nazareth. We bring our different visions and beliefs in communion to place our vision of God at the centre of our celebration, to share in our common spiritual heritage, our common hope and purpose. We also celebrate all of the ways in which we are connected to each other through God and all the ways in we are connected to God through each other. And inspired by the example of Jesus to affirm that connection in the sharing of bread and wine. When Jesus broke bread with his disciples at the meal known as the Last Supper, he was honouring the past and preparing for the future. He was honouring the Jewish tradition that he belonged to by celebrating the Passover meal. And through that, the covenant with God that bound the Jewish people together. He was also looking towards the future, to a new covenant, to a new intimate and dynamic relationship with God that no one is excluded from. The new universal covenant that binds everyone to God and to each other. Jesus declared that all who come to the table of God come as equals. Here at Kingswood Meeting House, anyone present is invited to join in this act of communion. Jesus laid down his life as an act of love to prove that love never dies and can never be destroyed. God's all-creating, all-redeeming, all-renewing love is freely poured, fresh every day, in every moment of the day. This is the gift of love by which the sick are healed and the broken are made whole. The Jesus that we meet in the Gospels is not asking us to bow down and worship him. He is asking us to walk alongside him and to bear witness with him to the presence of God in the beauty and mystery of the world and in the decency and dignity of human beings. Let us go forth into this world around us, guided by the love and courage of Jesus Christ, 
and let us remember, whenever we share together in love, Christ is with us. And so our worship draws to a close. And I leave you with words by John Horton from our Hinckley congregation. May the warmth of the fellowship we have shared today be with us throughout this coming week. May we take strength from the faith we hold. May we prove our faith in extending our love and tolerance to those whose ideals and values may be different from ours. May we seek and work for peace and understanding. And may we find strength in humility, courage in adversity, joy in diversity, and a true sense of purpose in our prayers and meditation. Amen.